My name is uh, Luis Carlos Reyes. This day I have a very special guest. This is going to be a very interesting video. I'm going to translate it. I'm going to try to translate and do this at the same time, okay? Uh, Dios les bendiga. Este día les habla su siervo Luis Carlos Reyes. Este día voy a hacer una entrevista muy especial. Tengo una persona muy especial que lo quiero introducir. Today uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Edward Delcourt. He serves as a tutor of dogmatic, systematic theology and New Testament for Greenwich School of Theology. He also holds the appointment of senior lecturer of the Northwest University Faculty of Theology. He is the president and founder of the Department of Christian Defense, a Christian apologetic ministry based in Los Angeles. He holds a master's in apologetics from Columbia University and a PhD in dogmatic theology from Northwest University. He's an international speaker. He's been featured in many Christian and secular radio uh, TV networks. Uh, Dr. Dalcour is a theological contributor to various theological journals and publications, has written numerous books, including this one here, a definitive look at one is theology in the light of biblical Trinitarianism, fourth edition. And uh, Dr. Dalcour lives here where I live, some in the area of Los Angeles. Dios les bendiga. Este día les introduzco al Dr. Edward Dalcour. Él es el maestro de dogmática teológica sistemática del Nuevo Testamento para la Escuela de Teología de Greenwich. También tiene el nombramiento de profesor titular de la Facultad de Teología de la Universidad del Noreste. Es el presidente y fundador del Departamento de Defensa Cristiana, un ministerio cristiano apologético basado en Los Ángeles, California. El doctor Del Court posee una maestría en apologética de Seminario Evangélico de Colombia y es un doctorado en filosofía en teología dogmática de la Universidad del Noreste. Y él es un este orador internacional y ha, apreciado en mucha, ha aparecido en muchas redes social y de radio y televisión cristianas y seculares. El doctor Dalcourt es un colaborador teológico de varias publicaciones y publicaciones teológicas y también ha escrito numerosos libros, folletos apologéticos contra las sectas. Un libro que acaba de leer, de escribir es este que se llama a Definitive Look at One is Theology in the Light of Biblical uh, Trinitarianism. Un punto de vista definitivo hacia la teología de los unicitarios a la luz de la Biblia y de la, de la, de la, de la, de la del punto de vista trinitario. How are you today? Very good. Thank you for the intro. <laughs> ¿Cómo está este día? Dice que muchas gracias. Gracias por, uh, por la introducción. El doctor uh, uh, Edward Dalcourt vive aquí en Estados Unidos, en Los Ángeles. You live here in Los Angeles, correct? I live in Los Angeles, born and raised. Yeah. <laughs> vive aquí en Los Ángeles y este es de mi área, pero solamente habla inglés, entonces que voy a tra tratar a traducir Uh, qué es lo que qué es lo que uh, podemos hablar porque es, esta persona muy interesante tiene mucho conocimiento en cuanto a las sectas universitarias. How long have you been involved in apologetics? I've been involved in apologetics uh, specifically with Department of Christian Defense, our uh, apologetic website www.christiandefense.org, since uh, gosh, probably the mid 90s. Wow. Dice que él ha estado, ha estado involucrado con uh, la apologética de los noventas, que también tiene una, una página de internet. When did you start writing this book? Um, I, I started writing, I think, in the early 2000s. One of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is because, I, you know, you go in most, when well, we used to have bookstores, yeah. most Christian bookstores are filled with books on Mormons, mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholics and other prolific non-Christian cults. Virtually nothing that refutes and shows the oneness Pentecostalism uh, as a false group, as a false religion, nothing, no material that refutes the views and actually affirms the God that we serve, a triune God. So I felt very necessary, that it was very necessary to write a book on oneness theology to educate the Christians so we can glorify God in our, in our presentation of the true God. That's awesome. And there's not that many um, books. There's only a couple now. No, there's, yeah, Bison wrote one. Um, th there's a few out there. A lot of them are, are pamphlets. Yeah. You know, but there's not a whole lot of material out yeah. there. Le, le pregunté al doctor de Alcourt que, por qué escribió este libro. Dijo que eh, cuando él empezó que no había nada escrito para el mundo uh, trinitario uh, que pudiera uh, explicar qué es lo que cree la doctrina unicitaria y poder refutar la doctrina unicitaria. Como él miró ese vacío, él comenzó a escribir este libro y, lo, y ya lo ha uh, escrito. Hay unos cuantos libros, poquitos, pero no hay muchos. Pero él dice que él lo hizo porque en ese tiempo no había nada en el mundo habla inglés que trataba con ese tema. Y en el español menos. En el español hay muy poco. Hasta estos días hay unos pocos uh, 
unas pocas obras que tienen esto. Do you plan to trans have this translated to Spanish? Um, I would like to, yes. Yeah? I, I would like to okay. get it translated to get to get out there, absolutely. Le pregunté que si él está, le interesará eh, traducir este libro a español. Dice que sí, está, lo está pensando. Y oremos para ver si primeramente Dios, el hermano uh, Dalcourt, puede tener este libro traducido a español. Porque está muy bueno este libro. This book is a really good book. It's got a lot of good stuff. He pretty heavy duty Thank arguments. You. Yeah. You, did, you did awesome here. Hiciste muy bien en este libro, le estoy diciendo al Señor. Uh, how many debates have you been involved in? Um, several debates. Uh, with one is Pentecostals, many informal debates, but a few formal debates. And um, uh, with debates, of course, it, it, it's sometimes it's difficult to find, a, as you know, a competent oneness Pentecostal that actually represents oneness theology. Because there's guys out there, um, like we talked about Stephen yeah. Ritchie, a lot of his views are rejected by oneness folks. And yeah. he has very bizarre views, like in, in John 1.1, this whole assertion that there's two persons. I don't know what that means, you know. A lot of his views do not represent the standard oneness arguments. And the reason why you have such a variation of oneness views is because there's, there's no standard theologian in oneness Pentecostalism. There's no standard textbook. There's no standard oneness lexicon. There's nothing standard about it because it was something that the majority of church um, Uh, rejected in the early church um, to the present day. So that's why you have this variation in groups. Wow. Le pregunté que cuántos debates ha hecho. Dice que ha hecho varios y que también ha hablado con muchas personas. Pero dice que lo que él ha visto que está, está difícil encontrar opositores de la, de la doctrina unicitaria uh, que sean fijos en su doctrina. Porque dice que hay muchas, hay, hay, un, hay unas ramas que creen una cosa y luego otras ramas que creen otra cosa. Y es cierto, eso ocurre en muchas, muchas otras creencias, pero cuando se trata de la, de la deidad de Dios, eso es algo muy diferente, o la preexistencia del Hijo. En uh, el Spanish world, it, the majority of the Spanish speaking one is people do not believe that God is a person. What, what do they, uh, what, what, is, what is the typical point of view in the English speaking world? En el punto de vista, le estoy diciendo que en el punto de vista uh, de los unitarios del mundo habla hispana, la mayoría de los unicitarios no creen que Dios es una persona. Y le estoy preguntando, ¿qué es lo que, qué es lo que ve en el mundo habla inglés? ¿Qué, ¿Qué creen los unitarios del mundo habla inglés? What, how do the um, English speaking one is people see this? Well, it depends which one you ask, but if you go to the UPC, the, their website, they used to print a track from Word of Flame called 60 Questions. And um, I think 60 Questions of the Trinity or 60 Questions, um, I, I forgot the, the rest of the mm -hmm. title. But one of the, it was like a catechism, you know, catechism question and answer for the oneness people. This is the UPC. UPCI. One of the questions was, does God exist as one person? Answer, yes. So you have the, one of the largest oneness denominations affirming that God is one person. In my experience, most oneness Pentecostals do see God as one person. And they argue, all their arguments stem from that premise that God is one person or unipersonalism, which is essentially tantamount or the same as Unitarianism. Él dice, el doctor uh, de, de Alcor dice que, que cuando él revisa la página de la Iglesia Pentecostal Unida original, decía que ellos, aquí en el mundo habla inglés, que Dios es, un, es una persona, una persona única, unipersonal. Y este es lo que defiende la, la, la mayoría de los unitarios de esta área. I think one of the reasons that, that the Spanish-speaking people do not want to refer to God as a person is because they picture a human being or they picture... So it's Jehovah's you, you Witnesses. Know, y le digo que una yo le digo a él que posiblemente una razón que muchos unitarios no, no acepten que Dios es una persona es porque en la mente unitaria muchos unitarios del mundo habla hispana se imaginan que Dios es un ser humano o una persona por eso. But when we mean person, what do we mean by that? Well, it's a common misrepresentation of person because Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing. Um, they equate person with people. But we know bi even biblically, if you're a people, you're necessarily a person. But if you're a person, you're not necessarily a people, Satan, angels. Why do we call uh, Satan a person? Why do we call angels persons? Simply because they have personal attributes. Mm. They have personal characteristics uh, dealing with the go uh, God. Now, for those oneness Pentecostals that use a King James, well, Hebrews 1.3 calls the Father, it says, of the Son. He, had, he is the uh, character, the exact representation or impress of the father's person. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So they have no problem in the trans uh, holding to a translation that calls God person. He's no respecter of persons, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in other uh, places where person is used, what we mean when we say God is person, um, God is three persons. The reason why we use person is because simply the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have personal attributes. They love. The Holy Spirit has a will. First Corinthians 12, he determines who get, get uh, gifts, right? You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve a rock. You can't grieve electricity. Um, and the same is true with the Father. He loves. It says he's a jealous God. Um, he gives commands. He speaks. It fulfills all the qualifications as a person, mm -hmm. not people. We don't mean people, mm -hmm. but something with personal characteristics and personal attributes would constitute person. That's why the church has enjoyed the term person. Lo que dice el doctor de Alcourt básicamente está diciendo que cuando cuando usan la, el término persona no se usa para describir a un ser humano o a un ser separado, sino que se usa para describir que existen algunas características personales que existen en Dios y muchas personas no pueden eh, mal interpretan eso como es que su, el trinitario usa las palabras persona. Uh, I've had people say to me, well, where did it say that God is a person? And you, you showed me the, the King James Version, that one part, but some a lot of translations don't say he's God's a person. But one thing I've said is, well, do you believe Moses was a person? And they'll say, yeah. But where did it say Moses was a person? The word person is not in there. But we know that. We can infer that because he, they reflect these qualities and characteristics that a person has. Le estoy diciendo que a veces le, me, me preguntan a mí en dónde dice que Dios es persona. En una traducción en inglés hay una vez donde se menciona, pero se menciona, es por la traducción. Pero yo le pregunto a las personas, por ejemplo, uh, en dónde dice que Moisés es persona. Pero la Biblia no dice que Moisés es persona, pero obviamente sabemos que es persona porque podemos inferir que tiene características personal. Do you know of anything in the Bible that that is um, that ha that that has personal characteristics that is not a person? Uh, no, actually, I don't. There, there's figurative languages, but you that would really wouldn't apply. And also, simply put, Jesus used in John chapter 14 through 16 personal pronouns to refer not only to himself but to refer to the Father and to refer to the Holy Spirit. So they use personal. Uh, masculine pronouns, sometimes dealing with the person of the spirit, and uh, e uh, Ekinos in chapter 16 would be a, a prime example where Jesus refers to the spirit. Now the word spirit is actually neuter, but you know in Greek that you know neuter doesn't or the gender doesn't necessarily follow to the natural gender. You know, yeah. I think babies, children are all neuter, loves neuter, so on and so forth. But Jesus used personal pronouns uh, to refer to the Holy Spirit and personal pronouns to refer to himself. All through the Gospels, Jesus used personal pronouns to refer to the Father, and the same is true in the converse. Le pregunté que si él conoce de algún referente en la Biblia que tenga características personal que no sea una persona. Dice que él no conoce de, de ninguna. Uh, hay, y en, hay unas ocasiones donde se encuentra la literatura metafóricamente, pero eso es un caso diferente. Uh, también menciona que a Dios se le tiene sus pronombres personal. Does the fact, do, does the fact that God refers to him in, himself in singular pronouns, does that in any way contradict uh, Trinitarian, Trinitarian theology? No, because, you know, simply put, in the Old Testament, there's many singular pronouns because we do not believe in many beings. That's a common misrepresentation of the Trinity that God, that we feel God has, uh, is, exists in many beings, right? That's Mormonism, that's, that's Hinduism, that's polytheism, that is not Trinitarianism. That was the mistake of not only many Jehovah's Witnesses, one is Pentecostals, but also Muslims. They assert the same thing. Muhammad had no idea what the Trinity was, that's why he never refutes it. The Trinity is never refuted in the Quran. Only the idea of three gods, but that is a straw man. That's not what Trinitarian doctrine teaches. Because God is one being, singular pronouns are, is used, are used all throughout the Old Testament, also the New Testament. However, because God exists multipersonal, plural words are used all through the Old Testament. Plural words all through the Old Testament. Plural nouns, plural adjectives, plural uh, verbs. Uh, plural prepositions are used because he's three persons, he's multipersonal. 
So I can allow the scripture to read for itself from Genesis to Revelation, and I can accept the plural words describing the one God. I can accept the singular words referring to the one God because he's one being revealed as a multipersonal being. Interesting, yeah. Eh, yo le pregunté que si el Trinitario tiene algún problema porque Dios se refiere como él solo como uno o en el singular. Dice que absolutamente no, porque Dios se puede referir como un solo ser, porque es un solo ser. Pero también existen muchos uh, pronombres que son plural o uh, evidencia que se describe como uh, plural, porque Dios es un ser que tiene distinción multipersonal en su ser, no que son tres seres, no que son tres pedazos. We're not saying that there's three beings, that there are three pieces of God, right. but that he's one God. Right, that he's one God. Also, I would point out, the Father really loves the Son. The Holy Spirit in Romans 15.30, Paul says, uh, by the love coming from the Spirit, the love of the Spirit, genitive of source, the source um, uh, of the love, Paul says, comes from the Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit loving, we have the Father loving, we have the Son loving. He says, I love my Father, mm -hmm. right? So the mere fact that these three persons love, I think, uh, is so clearly demonstrative that these are persons because electricity can't love. Muy, muy interesante lo que está diciendo, que también está significando lo, lo del amor de Dios que indica que hay distinción. Uh, y voy a expandir un poquito más en esto porque es un punto muy importante. So we're saying here that the son loves the father and the father loves the son, correct? Mm -hmm. But if the father is incarnated in Jesus as the one as people see it. So, so what is loving what there? Yeah, they would be, they would see two modes loving the same person. So you know, they would see him loving himself essentially. Jesus so, loves himself. Isn't that a little selfish? It's, very, it's a little <laughs> psychopath. <laughs> okay, so what, what they're saying is that the human nature is loving the divine nature? Yeah, and, and, and the opposite is true. The divine nature also loves the human okay. nature. Okay, entonces, Tadis, yo les pregunté, entonces, ¿qué es lo que se está amando aquí? Si el Padre ama al Hijo, el Hijo ama al Padre. Ama la carne a lo divino, lo divino a la carne. But natures, natures do not love. No, they're abstract. Only persons can love. Electricity can't love. Rocks can't love. Right. That is one of the main weaknesses. And we were just talking before. Many oneness Pentecostals come out. God saves them out of it. And many will tell you it was because of passages where the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and Jesus loves the Father, and also Jesus praying to the Father. Yeah. You can't just argue these things away. Yeah. You can't do it. And many come out of it because they see the, the utter ridiculousness of Jesus essentially loving himself. It's like your soul loves your spirit, <laughs> or your will loves yeah. your, your brain. You know, it just doesn't make sense at all yeah the, and we were just talking about i just i just spoke to a, a, a former oneness guy that just told me that very thing él dice que eh, en realidad el, los unitarios tienen un problema aquí porque tienen algo un, una naturaleza amando a otra naturaleza no es algo que hace una persona uh, natures are not persons they, they're they, abstract they, they're, son cosas abstractas y no pueden tener una relación íntima con algo más. Solamente personas. Only persons can have relationship with persons. Or something personal. Right. Yeah. Right? Um, so do you find that problem a lot? I find it a lot. Um, some would deny um, my usage of oneness as unipersonal. They believe in one person, Jesus, who comes out in modes as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They, some will object the word person. Most that I found, though, um, have no problem. UPCI. The largest oneness denomination has no problem saying that Jesus is the one person. Dice él que, que, la, que muchos, hay, hay algunos que, que no les gusta usar el término persona, unicitarios, pero por la mayoría, la iglesia pentecostal unida sí usa el término persona para referirse a Dios. Sometimes they'll say, well, God is spirit. Well, yeah, but is, is he a personal spirit or an impersonal spirit, I ask? And... They have to say he's a personal spirit. Yeah, unless they want to, you know, embrace Islam. They believe God is an impersonal, you know, he's impersonal. Um, personal characteristics, you know, yeah. personal pronouns are used. Yeah. He loves, he gets jealous. You can lie to the Holy Spirit, so on and so forth. Th these are attributes that only persons can possess. Let me ask you something. Uh, oh, Tab dijo que estas son cosas, atributos que solamente personas pueden poseer. Una naturaleza no es una persona. I had a debate re recently in Spanish uh, with uh, one of the leading uh, oneness Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I showed him 2 John 3. 
And um, I want you to take a look at it if you can. And uh, we were talking about Granville Sharp and some of his rules. And I quoted to him this verse of scripture. It's 2 John 3. Mm -hmm. 2 John 3. And in the Greek, there's a lot. There's something interesting here. Uh, but it's the text that says, well, maybe you could... It's, I'll, I'll read, I could read it in Greek. I'll, I'll, in, yeah, it says, right. Para theu patras kai para Jesu Christu, tu huiu tu patras. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Now, this one, uh, uh, let, let me translate it real quick. Okay. Este es el texto que le cité. A, yo tuve un debate recientemente en línea con un universitario. Y cité el texto de segunda de Juan 3 que dice para tu, para teu, patras kai, para Jesucristo, tu huiu, tu patras, que es uh, de Dios el Padre y de Jesucristo, Hijo del Padre. So, what I wanted to ask you about this verse here, uh, what, do you, what do you see in here? What, what, what's your opinion on this text? ¿Qué es tu opinión de este texto? Well, when, I mean, one thing we know, when you interpret the scriptures, when we look at the scriptures, we allow the text to read for itself. And we, we come to passages like, um, uh, Second John one three and also First John one three and first we look at the entirety of the theology of John of course, but looking at the passage, one thing I think um, I think this is very problematic for oneness. Grace, mercy, and peace will be uh, with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. So Jesus is the Son of the Father. Well, in one theology, Jesus is the Son and He is the Father. He's not the Son of the Father, right? He's the Son of Jesus. Right. That's what Jesus is, or that in one theology. But I think it's a great refutation for oneness because it actually calls Jesus by divine inspiration. If you believe in the infallibility of the text, by divine inspiration, Jesus is the Son of the Father. But in the text itself, in the exegesis of the text, Clearly, there's a differentiation between God the Father and God the Son. Clearly, there's a differentiation from Jesus and the Father, which um, you would have to strain to make this text read any other way. And I would challenge everyone to read it just in their, in their translation and ask the question, would they ever get the idea that Jesus was the Father from this text? Wow, okay. Not knowing anything, just reading this, this text. Le dice que este texto es devastador para la doctrina universitaria porque aquí Jesucristo dice que es el Hijo y está distinto del Padre. Dice que este texto, si uno lo lee así sin presuposiciones, es difícil creer de este texto que Jesús es la misma persona que el Padre. Also here, in, in the Greek they have what's called Granville Sharp Rule Number 5, right? Right. Uh, aquí también en el griego se ve lo que se conoce como la quinta regla de Granville Sharp. En Granville Sh uh, Rule Number 5, implies a distinction between the reference here, correct? Right. There's no, in the first part of the verse, there's no, um, there's no article in the mm -hmm. first part of the verse. Sí, está diciendo que la regla de Granville Sharp aquí este, sugiere que hay distinción entre el padre y el hijo. So I asked this question, and let me, I want to run it by you, see what you think. I asked the question here, and this one individual said that if the preposition precedes the, the, the noun here, and by the way, the Texas Receptus has kurios before Jesus Christ, in case right. they say that Jesus just, is a... Just noticed that. Yeah. So, some, some people say, well, that's a, a proper name, second oh, name. Oh, yeah. proper name. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let me ask you a question about this text here, uh, because in this debate that I had, uh -huh. uh, this one individual said that, yes, this is uh, Granville Sharp Rule Number 5, which shows a distinction, but the prepositions... Uh, have to be repeated twice before each now in order to make a complete distinction. And this verse has prepositions on both sides. So according to the criteria of this one individual, the, 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 there's a distinction between the Father and the Son. Uh, básicamente lo que estoy diciendo es que eh, este debate que tuve, la persona, el oponente unicitario me dijo que tenía que aparecer una preposición antes de cada sustantivo para que sean distintos. Y aquí es un caso donde aparece la preposición antes de cada sustantivo. Y el texto recepto no usa nombre propio, eh, no más Jesucristo, sino que también dice curio, que dice Señor. Entonces, aquí se ve una clara distinción. So, let me ask you this here. Uh, the Father is distinct by identity from the Son in this verse. That's how I see it. What do you see? Yeah, there, there's, again, would someone get the idea of the converse allowing this passage to read itself for itself? Pre pregunta el que si alguien, una persona que lee este pasaje sin presuposiciones, 
¿Puede concluir este pasaje que el Padre es el Hijo encarnado? And, and would they use the same rule in 1 John 1.3, about the repetition, the, the preposition, where we read in 1 John 1.3, we see a repetition of a preposition. We proclaim, I'm quoting it, we proclaim to you also that you too may have fellowship, and I'll read it, metatu mm -hmm. patras, with the Father, Kai, and metatu huya alto, and with our fellowship and with his son Jesus Christ. Here you have two prepositions, meta, it's repeated, with uh, the, the fellowship with the Father and with his son. And it says we have fellowship with, so you, you have the meta, you have this uh, preposition repeated actually three times, applied to us, applied to the Father, and applied to the Son. Would they use the same rule here? Mm. Wow, that's a really good point. Está diciendo que en primera de Juan 1.3 se repiten las preposiciones antes de padre y antes de hijo. Y saben que estoy notando otra cosa también aquí, que también aparece el artículo definido. Wow. You know what else I see here, uh, Dr. Mm. Delcor, that the definite article is also there. Yeah. It's before tu huil and yeah. tu patras. So not only do you have the preposition, you also have the article in there. So right. that, that's gravel sharp six. Mm -hmm. That's a clear distinction there. So, right. lo que él está diciendo aquí, lo, lo que está demostrando es que este texto de primera de Juan 1.3, uh, según el, de, el debate que tuve con el señor Cerrato, aquí se ve la preposición antes de padre y antes de hijo, y no solo la preposición, sino también el artículo definido, y los dos están conectados con Kai y están en el mismo caso, en el caso genitivo. Yeah, this... That one's even stronger than the other oh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Because this has the article. And I, I was just looking down at Ephesians 2.18, which has a repetition of the article. Uh, of the, I'm sorry, the repetition of prepositions. Look at look in Ephesians 2.18. ¿Quiere que vea Efesios 2.8? Porque también dice que hay aquí una repetición. Okay, I got it. No tengo. Read, uh, read Ephesians 2.18. Okay. Um, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Uh, hen and I, one spirit, right? Uh -huh. uh, Panumatai, proston, patra. So we have a preposition before the word for spirit. Then we have a preposition pros, proston, uh, patra, before uh, father. father. So would he apply the same room here where you have a repetition of... Uh, of the, the of prepositions, different prepositions. Aquí también está eh, demostrando otro ejemplo donde se menciona una preposición antes de los sustantivos. Por ejemplo, aquí se encuentra la preposición en antes de pneumati, que es espíritu, y la preposición pros, que es hacia tan patern, hacia el padre. In the, in, in the first part of the verse, um, uh, dia alto, that's to Christ. Oh, sí. So okay. you have dia before Christ, you have uh, you yeah. have uh, Um, N before the spirit, then you have pros before the father. And you have dia without two in the genitive case. What does that usually? Agency, yeah. So, to say... The whole, I mean, it's all over the place. So if he wants to maintain in 2 John 1, yeah. 3 that prepositions denote personhood, yeah. praise God, come to our church. It's time for you to get baptized. <laughs> dice just que, proved our position. Dice que si este, este de persona con la cual debatí quiere argumentar que la proposición los hace personas distintos, que gloria a Dios, que venga a nuestra iglesia porque usted es trinitario. Because he's a trinitarian then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he's, at least he's not a modalist. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay, wow. That really good, really interesting stuff. In my personal conversations and debates with many of these Pentecostals, one is Pentecostals, I heard a lot of wild stuff, and I'm sure you have when you, when you talk with some of these people in their conversations. Let's talk a little bit about some of the most common logical fallacies that you run into when you talk to them. Because a lot of our, our brothers and sisters... Uh, don't realize it. They may have uh, theological knowledge, but they don't realize it. there's a lot of tactics being used here right. that throw them off uh, off subject. So, uh, what what are the most common ones that I've seen is circular reasoning, where they presuppose something. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, a lot of times, and, and this is probably the main fallacy that I encounter when talking with one as Pentecostals. Um, they start with the premise that God is unipersonal, that God is un or unitarian. And then all their arguments really do flow from that premise. So every time they come to a passage that says one, like one God, well, that means one person, hoping no one will call them out on it. 
But my question is always, you know, show me a passage where God is called one person. Because one doesn't doesn't help you at all. Yeah. One what? Yeah. You know, one one corporation or one right. you know, what are you talking about here? Yeah. One what? So, and that's that's a fallacy mm -hmm. um, that they, they constantly I think engage in a misrepresentation of the word one. So they sneak that presupposition in and then they place the burden on you to try to show the opposite when it hasn't even been established. They haven't proved it. They haven't even circular, proved what they're yeah. saying. Le, le, le hice una pregunta que cuál es una falacia más común que él ha localizado cuando habla con los unitarios y es la misma que yo he localizado que es que siempre comienza por presuponer que Dios es solamente unipersonal o una persona al menos acá en Estados Unidos o que no puede ser Uh, 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 ¿Cómo se dice? Más de una persona. Comienzan con la presuposición de unipersonalidad y después uh, presentan su argumentación basado en eso, pero nunca han probado que es unipersonal. Cuando dice que es uno, nosotros creemos que es uno, pero ¿un qué? Creemos que es un solo ser. And the definition of monotheism means one being. Literally, one the theos, one God. One God. Yeah, one being. One, yeah. Not. It doesn't mean monopersonalism. It just means monotheism. So that would fit perfectly with Trinitarian uh, theology. Well, yeah, and then, again, in, in many debates, um, not only that I've observed, but my own personal debates, one God equals one person is the highlight of their, their, their whole substance of the yeah. debate. And I'll show them the, the plural words to describe the one God, for instance, in the Old Testament. There's many. And their response to that is, well, that doesn't compare to all these singular references. That doesn't compare. <laughs> so, so those parts in the Old Testament, all those plural words are not scripture. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. See, I don't have to do that. Right. I can look at the totality of the Bible and just allow the Bible to read, which is consistent with my view, not theirs. Just like scholarship, they're on my side, right. not theirs. So they have to uh, reinterpret these verses and find a way. See, if they don't do that, they, they have a theological contradiction. Crumbles. We, we don't have to do that. No, we can we accept don't. either way. I can accept the plural words because right. God is multipersonal. Because he could refer to himself as to his person. True God. Or he could refer to himself as to his being. Absolutely. And what we're talking about here, it's, it, this is not uh, secondary issues. These, these things are not secondary. They hold to the same concept, one is Pentecostals, of God that a Muslim would hold to. You know, some things are a little different how they see Jesus, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter, ontologically, God is one person for one is Pentecostals, God is one person for Islam, for Jehovah's Witnesses, and all these groups. So the, these aren't secondary issues. We need to evangelize one is Pentecostals. We need to show them the true God and pray that the true God saves them, because if they die tonight, they will certainly die without Christ and the true God. Wow, lo que él está diciendo está muy pesado. Está diciendo que tenemos que orar por los unicitarios, tenemos que evangelizar los unicitarios, porque si ellos mueren, van a morir, morir sin el Jesús de la Biblia, van a estar perdidos, porque no están creyendo en el Dios bíblico de la Biblia. Eh, esto es, muy, uh, muy, es algo que yo también siempre ando uh, destacando, porque es algo muy, muy importante. Uh, so, circular reasoning, that's a big one. Uh, uh, the, the, la falacia de argumentar por uh, círculo o el círculo vicioso es algo muy común que hacen los unitarios siempre comienzan por presuponer algo they also presuppose that God is that our God is three gods yeah, yeah. they put up a straw man and they you know they'll go again they'll go to all the passages to say God is one but in their mind God is one person and they'll accuse us of holding to polytheism yeah many gods which is just it tells me they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to Trinitarianism they haven't studied it they haven't you know, searched it out. They haven't really investigated it. They just assume wrongly that it means three gods. Bad, uh, it's, it's bad interaction because they're misrepresenting the view. Está diciendo él que, que una cosa que siempre ve es que la mayoría de los unitarios no tienen ninguna idea qué es lo que creen los trinitarios. Siempre nos acusan de creer en más de un Dios cuando eso no es lo que creemos. Y dice que cuando él escucha personas decir que, por ejemplo, les da muchos versos que solamente hay un Dios, a él le señala, le señala que en verdad no saben de, de qué es lo que están hablando. No conocen la doctrina que están criticando. So they don't really know what they're criticizing. They're criticizing, like you said, a straw man. Están criticando un monigote de paja. Um, can you give me some examples of other fallacies that you... 
Um, straw man fallacy is, is probably the more, more prominent fallacy, but also they, uh, many involve themselves in lexical abuse. Ah. From the you know, novice oneness guy, because he reads others, to the, um, the one that's experienced in oneness theology. What's a lexical abuse? Well, simply this. A lexicon defines, <coughs> excuse me, a lexicon defines, um, we'll take the New Testament. A lexicon will define Greek terms. And they'll define also Greek terms in its particular form, in its particular verse. Mm -hmm. And we have standard lexicons. So if I'm uh, looking at, for instance, John 17, 5, and I look at para, the preposition para, uh, which means with, uh, with the date of case. So I look at a lexicon and it will tell me, it will direct me and diagram the cases where para is used with the date of. Mm -hmm. And then it will show pra with the accusative in those verses. That's what a lexicon does. It gives us the definition of a word in a particular sentence and context. What lexical abuse is, is something that Roger Perkins, that we've experienced with Roger Perkins, and also we've experienced with others. Well, they'll look in a lexicon, and they'll kind of pick a meaning they like, or pick a meaning from the entirety of the entry, and they'll apply it wrongly to the verse that they're promoting. For instance, John 17, 5, where it says, para with the data, para soy, and then uh, before that, para so alto, together with yourself. You know, glorify me, Father, with the glory I shared with you, para soy, before the, uh, before the, 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 um, the world was, before the world was or became. Mm -hmm. um, they'll say, they'll go to Thayer's, and they'll say, hey, See, it's, it's in the mind, meaning he had glory, the Father had glory in the mind. That's what the Son is praying. Well, if you go to Thayer's, there is a meaning for in the mind. I'm looking at it right now, uh, near, beside, uh, in the mind. But Thayer doesn't give, or Grimm's actually, does not give in the entry an in the mind definition for John 17, 5. Mm. Rather, as I highlighted in Thayer's definition, para to theo, dwelling with God, then he gives John uh, 8, 38, and then in heaven, mm. John 17, 5. Mm. That's how Thayer's lexicon defines John 17, 5 and, and para with the date of. Not in the mind the John 17, 5. Wow. I would challenge anyone, show me one standard lexicon that has a meaning in the mind attached to John 17, 5. Just show me one, because wow. they're not out there. Wow, yeah, I haven't seen that either. That's lexical abuse. Yeah. Wow, es un punto muy interesante. Está hablando eh, el, el doctor Dalcourt de una cosa que ve mucho, son los abuses, los abusos lex, uh, léxicos de términos. Por ejemplo, en un léxico aparece un término en la entrada, y dice que mucha, muchos universitarios solamente toca, toman ese, esa entrada y después la llevan para otro lugar en un contexto y dicen que es lo que significa aquí, pero fallan en, en, en considerar las influencias del contexto y la inflexión, the inflection of the words, que, que le cambia el significado o el aspecto del verbo o de, 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 de la, del campo semántico del término. Eh, no consideran estas cosas y toman un significado de un léxico y nomás la entrada y después lo llevan para otro lugar y ignoran el contexto entero. También, por ejemplo, me citó un ejemplo donde estaba debatiendo con alguien y estaban hablando de Juan 17.5, donde dice la gloria que tenía contigo antes que el mundo fuera. Uno de dijo que era en la mente de Dios, pero y citó un léxico, pero no citó la parte correcta del léxico, sino que solamente lo llevó de una parte a otra y después llevó ese significado para Juan 17.5. Lo que hizo en el léxico de Thayer era un abuso de... Del, del léxico, básicamente, y dice que esto ve mu mucho él. Yo también lo veo mucho en el mundo habla hispana. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a really good one. Do you have any other examples? Or? Um, yeah, I was just looking at one, uh, Morphe, in um, Philippians 2.6. Dice que tiene otro ejemplo, por ejemplo, la palabra Morphe en Filipenses 2.6, donde dice forma. Uh, we see in, in Philippians 2.6 that um, who being, and the, the antecedent to the pronoun who being is Jesus Christ. Está hablando donde dice el cual siendo en la forma de Dios que el antecedente ahí es Jesucristo. My question again would be, can someone come to the text of Philippians 2, 6 through 11, read it and say, this must be all the Father. Dice, ¿puede alguien venir a este texto y leer este texto como está escrito y decir, oh, este debe de ser el Padre? Or, this must be the Son's ministry in his life. O, este debe de ser el ministerio terrenal del Hijo. You would never get that, that idea unless you were taught. 
Usted nunca sacaría tal otra conclusión, al menos que alguien se la haya enseñado. Verse 6. Who being uh, in very nature God existing, right? And morphe, in very form or nature, um, Theohoparkon, the participles used there, right? Hablando, dice, en Filipenses 12, es donde dice, el cual siendo la mera naturaleza o la forma de Dios, se usa el participio huparkon. Now, in terms of scholarship, the word is defined, uh, vines, uh, morphe, the essential and specific form and character of God. Um, one of the most standard um, lexicons, Bauer, Gringrich, Donker, or not, or Badag, The term denotes uh, specific qualities, essential attributes of something. Here, the expression of divinity in the pre-existent Christ. Wow, está mencionando léxicos que dicen que en este texto, uh, and it's mentioning these actual texts. Yeah, and, the, and we can go on and on. Look yeah. at F.F. F. Bruce, the Theological Dictionary of New Testament Words, and, and I like what Warfield said. Um, the, the, uh, the substance of God that makes God God, I believe he... he To find it in that way. La sustancia de Dios que hace a Dios Dios o la naturaleza de Dios. Entonces está hablando de Jesús. This is speaking about the Son, correct? Yeah, it was the Son who died. It was the Son who. Keep in mind the context. Of, now, this is something else that one as people do. They ignore the context and they focus on a word. Yeah. Words are not defined in a vacuum, they're not defined in isolation. Anyone who's taken just a basic course in hermeneutics, this is 101. Words are defined by the context, just like English, just like Spanish, mm -hmm. just like most languages. Yeah. Well, what they do, they'll focus on a word and they'll do concordance kind of footloose theology. They'll, they'll look at all the possible meanings of a word and then they'll apply whatever meaning or all of the meanings or mm -hmm. whatever the meaning they like. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Morphe and, uh, and um, Hoparco and the participle, clearly this is the son because the context of Philippians is, is humility. Read the verses before verse 6. Humility. Then Paul provides the ultimate act of humility. What was the ultimate act of humility? God, uh, uh, or who, although, it, always subsisting, who park owned in the nature of God or form of God, did not think it was, um, uh, did not think equality with God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Mm -hmm. Did the Father not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped? No, this would have to be the son. Mm -hmm. And he did this before he emptied himself. Mm -hmm. It can't be the father because the father, first the context is the son hum uh, humbling himself. Yeah. The father does not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Yeah. Humbled himself. And, and there's different, different one is Pentecostals or modalists view this passage differently. Some say it's the pre-existent father that incarnated himself. Some say that it was just referring to his earthly ministry. But they, they try to do this just to avoid... Uh, the pre-existence of the referent of Jesus there. All scholarship, you know, you, you can pick up any commentator, any lexical source, any theological grammarian, and they all, they're all on my side. They're all Trinitarians in this verse, seeing the humility of the Son, because reflexive pronouns are used. And the Son does does something before he empties himself. Está hablando mucho del texto de Filipenses 2, del 5 para abajo, y está hablando que en ese texto se está refiriendo, obviamente, al Hijo, y que se refiere al Hijo como haciendo, considerando, uh, pensando, antes del momento de la encarnación. Entonces, en Filipenses 2, 5, 6 y 7, se habla del Hijo de Dios existiendo ya en la naturaleza de Dios, y después tomó forma de hombre. And then it says that he took upon the form of a man. Yeah, he becoming, it's a part of becoming the form of a man. Yeah. When, when did the father ever do that? You know. Uh, and, and if this was referring just to the earthly Jesus, how could a man become a man again? Did he become a man twice? Yeah, because the, the whole act, the, the verbs, there's verbs that come before the emptying, like considering right. equality of God, a thing to be grasped, uh, being uh, the, the participle in, in verse 6. Who being the yeah. very nature of God. This is all before he emptied himself. Yeah. He emptied himself. The father didn't empty himself because the reflexive pronoun, uh, e alton, uh, ekonosin, yeah. he himself emptied himself. Right. How did he do this? The next participle, labon, taking the very morphe, the very nature of form of a man. That's how he emptied himself. The father never did this. The son did this, and it was in 
Bethlehem. That's when he emptied himself. And it was the same son in verse 6 who was uh, always existing, who parkon in the nature of God. That, that's very interesting. You know what's very, uh, uh, now that you mentioned this verse here, Galatians 4.4 4 is a verse that one is people usually cite. Mm -hmm. And it reads like this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of, a, born of a woman, born under the law. That word born there, phenomenon, mm -hmm. they say it means that he came to exist. But what's interesting is that same word is the one that we see in Philippians 2.7. Right. So if some of these people, some of these one is people say that this is just a reference to the earthly, to, to the earthly son. Right. So why did it say that the son came to exist as a man? Wasn't right. he already a man before he came to exist as a man? Yeah, that, that would be that, redundant. What, what would be the point of that? That's why a lot of um, that's why it's so problematic to, to assert either it's all the father, or it's all the son, because both um, uh, or the, the, the emptying was just uh, the, the human son, because they both have theological problems and it doesn't match verse six. It doesn't match the context, it doesn't match. nor does it match the, the, the actual subject of all those verbs. Le estoy mencionando que en Filipenses 2.2 este, se usa donde dice que se, que se dice que fue hecho de mujer, en, perdón, Galatas 4.4, donde dice, más viniendo el cumplimiento del tiempo, Dios envió a su hijo hecho de mujer. Le menciono que los unitarios siempre citan este texto de Galatas 4.4 para decir que el hijo comenzó a existir, porque dice que hecho de mujer. Le mencioné que la palabra griega, genomenon, es la misma que se localiza en Filipenses 2. Y este en Filipenses 2 es donde dice que se hizo hombre. Bueno, si... Si el hijo comenzó a existir en Galatas 4.4, porque se usa ese término, entonces por la misma razón indica que comenzó a existir como hombre en Filipenses capítulo 2. Pero el problema es que algunas personas no creen que Jesucristo preexistía ahí. Entonces ahí tendrían a un hombre que se hizo hombre dos veces. Y obviamente eso es una contradicción, es una contradicción absurda. Okay, uh, mention a few more fallacies. Uh, how about grammatical fallacies? Did we, we I don't think we talked about that. Have you have any ideas of any grammatical fallacies that you've run into? Um, Whatever they may be? Yeah, um, gosh. A lot of the grammatical fallacies are fallacies in which the grammar is ignored. Or fallacies in grammar where a, a, a rule is, e a, 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 a false rule is either imposed that no one agrees to, no grammarians agree to, and mm -hmm. it's just imposed because of their particular theology. Mm -hmm. Or it's um, when they ignore the grammar and mm -hmm. misrepresent the grammar. For instance, in the Salutations, we talked about mm -hmm. this. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you know, in all Paul's Salutations, the, the, the article's omitted, mm -hmm. and that would be a Granville Sharp 5. And many Oneness Pentecostals and others um, think there's, when we say Granville Sharp, there's only one rule. Well, there were six. Yeah. And I want to mention this, Granville Sharp was a Trinitarian. He was on my side. <laughs> he saw, and he was incredible yeah. in terms of his, his skill his, um, and, and what he contributed with this short, you know, yeah. this short article on, the, yeah. on, the, um, on his rules. He didn't invent the rules, he discovered them. Right. The salutations, and this is a fallacy, this, this practice, has no articles, but notice the conjunction, grace and peace to you from God the Father, and, it has the and there, Kai, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They will say simply this, the word and could be translated as even, the ascensive conjunction. Like, like also. Yeah. Right. So they would translate it, grace and peace to you from God the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ, mm, you know. Mm. So here's a case where they're they're imposing a rule, and the Kai's used about gosh, I think more than nine thousand times yeah. in the New Testament. Most, at least a third of those times, it's a connective conjunction. Mm -hmm. We just allow the verse to mean for itself. So they do this. The, the ones that have done this, they do it basically where it's, there's a distinction between Jesus and the Father. Well, they do it to show that. The God the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ, the they're same all the person. same person. Yeah. But would you do this between grace and peace, the conjunction there? Right, right. Is grace, it, even peace. Yeah. Would, no, would it, it just, be the same reference? It doesn't read like that. Right. And it, the, the, again, we look at Paul's literature in totality yeah. because the same books clearly differentiate um, by prepositions, yeah. by articles, oh, yeah. Different ways. by context. Yeah. 
all over the place so in that, his letters. So that's a clear example of abuse of grammar. La, le pregunté una pregunta que si él ha visto, él ha visto experimentado o ha visto algunos unitarios que le pregunté al doctor uh, del course si él ha visto ejemplos donde las personas de los unitarios abusan la gramática. Dice que sí. Por ejemplo, dice que en muchas de las salutaciones donde dice uh, bendiciones de Dios el Padre y del Señor Jesucristo, dice que algunas veces traducen el y como que es la misma persona. Y en algunos casos, muchos casos no es así. Porque también la, dice gracia y paz. La paz y la gracia no son la misma cosa. Y se usa ahí también la, la conjunción. Pero lo que tiene que hacer es que siempre se tiene que ver el contexto para ver en dónde se traduce de una manera y dónde no. How about uh, any examples of a, a red herring? Have you run into that when you're debating or talking to one of people? Um, yeah, frequently, especially those that don't do a lot of debate. Well, both. Um, well, they're, it's, a, it's a fallacy of distraction. They'll do it different ways. They'll either um, pose something so irrelevant bring it into the argument just to distract. We're talking about some of the folks that, that do that. Um, or they'll use a red herring by, by actually adding an ad hominem. They'll attack, your, mm -hmm. attack you because you believe in this position. Mm. All of them are fallacies of ir irrelevance. Dice que también hay falacias donde a veces meten información que no tiene nada que ver con el tema solamente para que se salga el tema y para que no traten con el punto con el cual se está tratando. Dice que también eso, esa es una falacia. And we also have, a, how about examples of citing out of context? Have you ever run into that? Uh, ¿Usted ha, ha, ha hablado con unitarios donde ellos citan algo de fuera de contexto? Oh, gosh. Uh, unfortunately, everyone does that. <laughs> cite out of context. And again, they, they do this when they will focus on a word and then they'll cite a unrelated reference. They mm -hmm. use um, illegitimate cross-referencing. Um, they do that with Colossians 2.9 and they'll cross-reference to another place that may have the same word. Oh, sí, lo, a veces dice que sí ha visto esto, por ejemplo, en Colosenses 2.9, cuando ve una palabra, después van para otro lugar y toman la misma palabra. Y este, uh, también a veces citan información fuera de, de contexto de referencias. Yo he tenido mucha experiencia con eso, con un debate que tuve con un unicitario, uh, en un debate escrito sobre Juan 1.1, donde sacaba uh, información de un, fuera de contexto, por ejemplo, cuando decía, decía que Atanasio, es, Atanasio decía que omnipotente el Padre, omnipotente el Hijo, omnipotente el Espíritu Santo, y decía que el sufijo ente significa ser. Entonces él decía que Atanasio estaba diciendo que el Padre, el Hijo y el Espíritu Santo eran tres seres. Lo que hizo fue que tomó una entrada de una parte del diccionario y otra parte de otra para unirlas y sacar una, una creencia ridícula. Uh, yo le demostré que también dice que es eh, la palabra ahí absorbante, absorbente, absorbante, absorbente. Y obviamente un absorbente no es una deidad, no es un ser que absorbe. También le mencioné que él mismo decía omnipotente, uh, que Dios era omnipotente y omnisciente. Y si él este, uh, llevara esa conclusión a... Uh, a lo final, entonces tendría que incluir que Dios era dos seres también, porque es omnisciente y omnipresente. Obviamente, el sufijo ente no significa que se refiere a un ser. El sufijo ente es lo que le da la calidad de ser esa cosa. Uh, this, one, this one gentleman that I, I was talking to, he was saying that uh, Athanasius believed in three gods because he said, he said omnipotent the Father, omnipotent the Son, omnipotent the Holy Spirit. He said that the ent suffix there in the Latin meant he, that means being. And I said, well, wait a minute, you just said that God was omnipotent and omniscient. Does that mean he's two beings? No. So it just the, citing something out of context, and that's what they and, did. And another fallacy, as you're talking about Athanasius, most Christians. This is fair to say to, about Christians yeah. too. But most one is Pentecostals that I've encountered, and Joe Witnesses, Mormons are notorious. No, they don't know how to read church fathers, mm. and the church fathers wrote in different languages. And unless you really examine their context and not come into patristic studies with the idea that church fathers were infallible. Mm. Some are really smart, mm -hmm. some are not so smart. Mm -hmm. I think Eusebius called Papias stupid. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, for instance, Irenaeus said, um, God became man so man could become God. Mm. Now, Mormons use that all the time. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's not that he didn't say that, but the question is, and this is where People need to learn how to, how to uh, rightly read church fathers. The question is, what did he mean by that? Yeah. 
And we see clearly he was not talking about man becoming ontologically like God, mm. but he meant it in the same sense as, as, as Peter, talking about the divine nature and all these things. Oh, okay. Está mencionando también que es muy importante que tengan en mente cuando lean las escrituras de los padres apostólicos, que también se tiene que leer en su contexto, porque a veces dicen cosas que se oyen como que, como que no están bien o como que sí están bien, pero que siempre tienen que leerlo en su contexto para ver qué es lo que significa. Y este... Uh, porque a veces decían unas cosas que no se, como que se ven contradictorias. Es muy importante que tienen que leer, leer todo en su contexto y qué es lo que esa persona quería decir cuando dijo eso. Uh, appeal to authority, improper appeal to authority. I'm sure you ran into that. Cuando, uh, usted uh, uh, se ha localizado con unitarios que citan algo de autoridad, pero impropiamente. Yes, um, what's common with one is Pentecostals, they'll quote scholars, but they quote our scholars. Ah, dice que no algo quote. muy común es que los universitarios mm -hmm. citan a los eruditos, sí, pero siempre citan a los eruditos trinitarios. They'll quote Robinson, they'll quote uh, um, uh, Barnes, they'll quote all these guys. The last debate, the guy did it, and I challenged everyone, please read their materials. These guys were trinitarians. They rejected oneness theology. Please read their materials. It's amazing that they quote trinitarians. To try to somehow buttress their own position. Well, that's why they do that. That's, yeah. Él dice que en un debate que tuvo que su oponente citó puros trinitarios y dice él dice todos estos son trinitarios debes de leer qué es lo que dicen porque todos estos trinitarios están apoyando lo que yo digo y este pero a veces los unitarios lo citan porque piensan que van a agarrar el apoyo. Why do you think they don't quote? Why do you think they don't quote oneness scholars, for example, like in John one one or something? Well, because no one recognizes oneness scholars as scholarly because they're, you know, and it's interesting, these guys go to our universities. Wow. A lot of them are educated in Trinitarian universities. And that is a classic case of appealing to authority. Because you can find any, we were talking about John 1. -1. You told me that the only, the only commentators that you found yeah. that actually have a similar view to a translation the, similar to John 1 yeah who, who were they they were the Masons the Masons. In morals and dogma that's yeah. the only thing I found and uh, le estoy diciendo que uh, por qué es que los unitarios no citan a uh, eruditos unitarios dice porque en verdad no hay there are no one is, uh, or if, if there are some but I mean they don't really put their reputation out on the line they don't have any recognized theologians recognized scholars in, in the world of scholarship oh, dice es que, es que no tienen unitarios uh, teólogos eruditos que sean reconocidos por el mundo académico mundialmente a nivel internacional por eso es que no lo citan yo le, yo le mencioné el que yo, yo en un debate que tuve uh, reté a mi oponente que me diera un léxico o alguna gramática que apoya la interpretación que ellos tienen sobre Juan 1.1 y el señor Clavijo his name was Mr. Clavijo didn't, didn't even give me one reference no me dio ni una referencia de algún erudito griego que diga que Juan 1.1 significa lo que los unitarios dicen. This, this my opponent in my, my debate could not list one reference, not even one reference from a grammar, a lexicon, or any academic reference that shows me that he understood John 1.1 the way one is people interpret it. Yeah, if you, write, if, if you read uh, grammar, Christian grammarians, um, even non like Robert Funk, clearly he's not a, he doesn't believe mm -hmm. that Jesus said all these things, mm -hmm. but he can can interpret and, and, and look at the grammar. He's a grammarian. And I always challenge, show me one, one recognized grammarian commentator, systematic theologian, that has a oneness view on Matthew 28, 19, on John 1, 1, John 17, 5, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Just show me one. They're not out there because scripture doesn't teach. It's not consistent to the oneness view. Another thing they misrepresent is translations. They will go to translation, they'll find, you know, they'll look at a hundred translations, they'll find one that matches their theology. <laughs> Even though the translation they quote on the committee of translators, they were Trinitarians, like the NIV, you know, you have Trinitarians, I think uh, um, uh, Douglas Moo was uh, one of the main proponents of the translation committee, but they do this with Galatians 3.20, and I'm reading it now, uh, a mediator is not one, for uh, it is not for one party only. I'm reading from the NASB. Whereas God is one. That's what it says in the Greek. That's what it says in this translation. God is Hayes. He's one. Okay. The interesting thing about this is that the old Amplified, mm -hmm. not the revised one, not the new one, the old Amplified read like this. 
Um, there's there's one mediator. Our mediator is is not for one party only, whereas God is one person. Oh. So they use that to somehow say, see, you know, look at the Amplified. Well, the problem is, number one, the context isn't ontology here. It's not discussing Unitarianism. It's discussing uh, uh, the role of, uh, of Jesus as mediator. It's discussing the mediator, um, the agency of a mediator, and the law, and so on and so forth. Well, the translators of the uh, Amplified were not Unitarian. That's not what they meant. But because it said that, and this is in the context of mediation, because it said that, they used that. Very sloppy scholarship to, wow. do, to do that method. Wow, that is not scholarly at all. Está demostrando, por ejemplo, que como algunos universitarios solamente seleccionan las traducciones que les conviene e ignoran todas las demás y, y que en unos casos que nomás lo, nomás lo citan porque es la única cosa que los apoya, como un ejemplo que me dio de inglés, de, de la Biblia amplificada en inglés, donde dice que Dios es una persona. Y este, uh, the Spanish people wouldn't even agree with that, the Spanish ones, because they don't believe he's a one, he's a person. And the text actually, I'm reading the Greek right here, Theos, Heis, Estin, God is one. It doesn't say anything, there's, <laughs> you, you know, um, uh, Luis, there, there's several words in Greek that could mean uh, person. But any of those words, none of those words are not used here. All it says literally in the Greek text he's is one. Theos, Heis, Estin, God yeah. is one. That's all it says. Yeah. You would have to read into it, and that's my challenge again. If you were, you'd start with a clean slate. You open the Bible, you open John, the Gospel of John. You would never get the idea that Jesus is the Father. You open Paul's letters and read them. You would never get the idea that Jesus is the Father. But the Father loves the Son. Jesus prays to the Father. They're differentiated in the great benediction. Uh, dictions and and doxologies like Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen all the persons new, uh, dozens and dozens of times are all the persons um, in the same verse or context that we find. Dice que si uno lee la Biblia solamente imparcio, y, uh, sin las presuposiciones nunca van a concluir que Jesús es el Padre. Eso es porque ya comienzan con la idea la presuposición de eso hey I wanted to read to you this one uh, this one translation that I found on John 1.1 uh -huh. the one that we were talking about the, the one that I found that supports the oneness interpretation of John 1.1 and I was trying to find any support for the oneness interpretation of John 1.1 and I did I found one let me read it to you in the beginning is the word and the word and logic formulated speech the spoken reason the word is in God and is God himself manifested to the intelligence? That's the closest that I found to the mm. idea that the, that the word is just a speech or the reason of the Father. And you know where I found this, brother? Mm. I found it in Albert Pike's Masonic Morals and Dogma. So a Mason interpreted like that. Yeah. Le estoy diciendo que la única locación donde yo encontré algo parecido a la traducción de Juan 1.1 como la ven los unicitarios, fue en el libro masónico de los, de la, de los masónicos uh, morales y dogma. What do you think of that? That is incredible. <laughs> how the only ones that interpret. Well, be because it, it's quite um, theologically impossible to interpret John 1 1 as a oneness Pentecostal does, especially when you see what they do. They'll, they'll, they'll rest on John 1 1, but there's also John 1 3. The Son is the Creator. Panta uh, de Al. Uh, um, Panta. The alto agenita, all things came from him. The sun is there, the, the eternal word. And in verse four, the sun was life. In verse six, it says John the Baptist was a, he testified as to the word. Who did he testify? You, you read in the gospels, who did John testify to? He testified as to the Christ, as to a person. He did not testify as to this, um, this idea as they would assert on John 1.1. And it says John was a testifier as to the word. He testified of Christ. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh. And 118 is a, is a fantastic passage that refutes the oneness position because it calls the son monogamous theos, the one and only God. Está diciendo que cómo es que la Biblia claramente está contradiciendo toda la doctrina unicitaria. Le quería mencionar una cosa más. Have you ever heard of a person called Arthur E. Overbury? He lived in 1925. He's interesting because I want to show you how he translated this verse, John 1.1. Yeah, let me show it to you. Because this is the second, the second one 
that I found that supports uh, the oneness interpretation of John 1.1, 1, 1, okay? And let me read it to you. In the original being, the word or God idea existed. Hmm. And the God idea existed in the at one mint with God. Oh, yeah, one. And the God idea was God manifest. Doesn't that sound kind of modalistic? Like the oneness? You know where this came from? This came from, Christian science. This, this came from the people's new covenant. This ideology it has occultic ties. And these are the only places that I found the idea that the, the oneness interpretation of John 1 1. Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting. At one mint. <laughs> sound like Mary Baker Eddy. And I wanted to mention to you, uh, have you ever encountered the, uh, like we call it the moving the goalpost fallacy, where, you Oh, know, yeah, and that's, that normally comes when someone gets um, a difficult passage or a concept, and they, they're not comfortable answering, they haven't studied or researched it out. Yeah. So what do they do? They just go to a different topic. Yeah. That's yeah. very commonplace in debate. They just go to a different verse without treating uh, oh. the verse in question. Or, or they move it. They change it after it's refuted. You yeah, know they, what I'm they saying? Go to a different topic. Yeah, well, and it, move the yeah. argument. If you do X, you got to show me one place where the Bible yeah. says X, X, and uh, X, whatever. You show them. Oh, well, it says X. Oh, well, I didn't really mean X. I meant really negative X. Or and then they make it smaller. They then, then you show them. You refute that point, and they say, "Well, uh, well, I didn't really mean that. I, I really meant all oh, this too." So they yeah, keep yeah. changing it because every time they're refuted, they're, they're trying to save their argument. It's already been refuted. And some are very desperate. Some are very it's desperate. Very evident to the to the hearer and so on. And so for forth. for example, this guy uh, Richie. Yeah. Oh. Well, he. Uh, do you, I don't know if you remember what he did with Philippians chapter two, where it says who parkon. He said that huparkon yeah. means that he had a beginning. He made an entire video on this, saying that that the sun had a beginning. So that's his whole argument. And he, he did the same thing, but as a matter of fact, he went through the, uh, just took the lexical entry of, uh, of huparkon. It's not the inflected form that he was looking at. And then uh, he says that Jesus had a beginning. So I, I uh, sent him a message on Acts 17.24, where Jehovah God right there is said to be huparkon. It's the same, it's the same inflected form. Yeah. So I asked him, so if this means that Jesus had a beginning, does this mean that Jehovah had a beginning? And then you could see him try to move the goalpost. Yeah. Trying to say, well, he actually had a beginning, but the beginning of the ministry as a father of heaven and, and of earth. So that's a, to me, that was a clear example of the fallacy yeah. of moving the goalpost. He's not familiar with Greek. I can tell you, you know, watching him and the, the few times, it's painful to watch, but he, he wants to set this image construct that he knows Greek, that he's familiar. He shouldn't use Greek because he just embarrasses himself. He doesn't know Greek. He doesn't know how to read a lexicon. And he um, constantly does this in his videos, hoping no one will really find out. Wow. You know, at first, when I first spoke with him um, via, via uh, the comments and emails, mm -hmm. He challenged me to a debate, and I said, yeah, I'm willing to debate you. But then he said, well, you don't hold any degrees, so I don't want to debate you. And all of a sudden, he didn't want to talk to me anymore. But said, I'm willing to debate you anywhere, in written form. Or in, I'll even do it in Spanish if you want. You know. But uh, that terminated. This is still open. If Richie still wants to debate me, I'm open to debate him. But uh, has he ever asked you to debate him? Uh, he, he, he agreed. He wanted to debate, and then he said um, you know, he got tied up in a schedule. He wanted to debate. Um, in like a private studio, I said no. Let's let's make it at a church. But um, I, I'm reluctant to follow through because of how rich he is. He doesn't really represent oneness theology. What, what do you mean by that? What do you mean he doesn't represent? Well, for instance, his view on John one one. No oneness that I've ever heard of or read sees John one one like he does. He mentions two persons, like this Bitarian view. It's bizarre. Wow, that's, he, not, that's not what David Bernard teaches, is it? No, that's not what anyone teaches. I don't know any oneness who holds to Richie's view. So he's not really competent in, in his own oneness theology. So, so he's not really representing oneness then? No, and then what, how does, in, in John 6, he's, he, doesn't he claim that in John 6, 38, 6 38 right. that's the Holy Spirit? Right. Just crazy. Yeah. You know, so he should probably not, I mean, I don't know how he does it and not get embarrassed. So that's, that's one of the reasons you probably would not. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a, a location if he wants to fly up here, you know, because he, he loves making videos because <laughs> they're safe. He loves making right. videos and um, he shouldn't, he should really stay away from Greek, wow. but he likes to make videos. He always makes one on, on me, you know, yeah. I haven't seen him, but. What what uh what what other oneness apologists do you think out that are out there right now that are the leading oneness apologists that are accurately representing the oneness position? Um, there, there's different views. I understand that. Well, the the ones that are actually debating out there, you of course you have Roger Perkins, um, 
in, at least debating in a in a formal public mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Anderson or any of these other guys actually Delay. do formal debates. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't know, but uh, the, in the Spanish world, there there's a couple of them. I've debated. I think I've debated most of there them. Maybe more in the Spanish world that are actually uh, doing debates. But the common thing is that we see the same fallacies. We see them in the Spanish world. We see them in the English world. And and uh, in reality, the Spanish world to me is behind about 20 years in research compared to the uh, the uh, English speaking world. That's what I see because I, I I could see them from both sides, but they're catching up. They're catching up. Which they're is trying. which is unfortunate because um, even out here, the the mainline apologists are you know they're focusing here on English speaking people right. and so on and so forth. I know with the group that I travel with, we're, you know we're going to Philippines and we're distributing all kinds of material and we're teaching pastors. Uh, we go to Nigeria and uh, Nepal the end of November. And that's what we do because we need to get the information out because there's a lot of Christians. That are, are that need help doctrinally. Yeah. Paul calls them the, the you know those that are weak in the faith. We need to help them. Yeah. And in the Spanish community, we need to help them because, as you said, there's just a lack of information. Yeah. And we need to promote the true God, and we need to help people who are struggling and people who are being uh, deceived by oneness oneness theology. Because a lot of people, as you we were just discussing, they don't realize. You know, they might hold to a modalistic form. And not understand what they actually believe. Right. They don't. They don't know what they. they a lot of them don't know what they believe, and uh, it's really sad. El, el señor, el doctor uh, del Cor está diciendo que tenemos que uh, orar por los universitarios porque son, son personas que están perdidas y que es, hay mucho que que también importan ellos. Tenemos que orar por ellos. Tenemos que uh, evangelizarlos a ellos para que salgan de esa secta. Uh, I'm sure we can talk all day, but uh, is there is there anything else you want to add? I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. Maybe we could make another video in the future of exegeting passages. You know, I, I yeah, and if anyone is a oneness person watching, um, you know, the, the the scripture says in John four twenty four, those who worship God must worship. Jesus said this was must worship Him in spirit and truth. The only true God is the God who's revealed in Scripture. If someone can just read this text. And allow the context, allow the words to mean what they mean. Allow it to speak. They would never get the idea that God is a unipersonal being that comes out in different modes. That Jesus is actually praying, his divine nature is praying to, uh, or his human nature is praying to his divine. You would never get that idea. Allow the text to read for itself. There's so many passages where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are juxtaposed together in the same verse or in the same context. Same with the Father and Son, over and over and over. It's as if God is shouting, I'm revealing myself as tri-personal, not a Unitarian with the Muslims believe, oneness, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on and so forth. It, there's no passage that says God is one person. Just allow the text to read for itself, and we're going to pray for the oneness people because we want to see them saved. Dijo que, que quiere que los, los unitarios se salven y que dejen la Biblia dar por sí mismo, que donde quiera se ve por toda la Biblia que hay distinción entre el Padre y el Hijo, y que si lo leen sin presuposiciones lo van a ver. You're right, because they look at these verses like the salutations, uh, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This would mean, in, in the oneness mind, from God the Father and God the Father in the flesh. Why would, why would he say... It's like saying, hey, I, I send greetings to you from the president and from the president. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, why are you being redundant? Why are you making me process so much information if it's not relevant? Right. Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, and that's what the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate? And the scripture teaches plainly the differentiations between three persons. Plainly. La escritura enseña plenamente y claramente que hay distinción entre las tres personas en Dios. And by distinction, you don't mean that they're separated, correct? No, they're not separated. They're distinct persons yeah. that have an IU relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As Genesis 126, let us make man in, in our image. Dice que por distinción no, no quiere decir separados, sino que tienen la, la, la característica de tener identidad uno con el otro. Well, thank you very much for, for doing this video. Maybe we'll do some more in the future. I don't know. Let's see, let's see how this goes. Uh, I mean, I'd love to just go through the text. I, I, for me, my, my perspective is if we just go through the text and exegete the passage in its context, there's a lot we can do. And we consider the, the historical context or every, everything that's relevant to it. I think we can get some really interesting uh, uh, conversations going. Well, is there anything else you want to say? No, man, we're, we're just going to pray for the oneness people, though. All right. Dice que vamos a orar por los solicitarios 
y este uh, que vamos ojalá primeramente Dios hacemos más videos este es el primero que hago en español es poquito difícil que traducir y hacerlo en inglés al mismo tiempo pero a ver cómo nos va este thank you very much for doing this it's been it's been a, thank you, it's, been, it's been a pleasure great great and uh, le digo que muchas gracias que hizo esta entrevista que es un placer este entrevistarlo y a veces uh, podemos seguir hablando Dios les bendiga God bless you guys God bless